If you are new to our channel, don't forget to hit that subscribe button. Emily Murphy is the author of Grow What You Love and, and, and of the foodie-centric gardening blog, Pass the Pistol, and one of Cent Garden Design Magazine's Most Loved Blogs of 2015. Emily is a web series host, a contributor to Better Homes and Gardens, a garden design organic gardening consultant, and a teacher of organic gardening. Welcome to the program, Emily. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Well, thank you for taking time and sharing some of your garden knowledge with Holly, myself, and all of our listeners here. Oh, I'm really happy. I'm happy I could be on. Well, through all of your experiences, why do you think people commonly grow what they don't like to eat? How does that it, happen? Isn't that a funny thing that you you could spend a whole summer tending to a garden and then end up with uh, tons of green beans or whatever it might be that you're really not interested in eating? It, it can seem a little bit uh, confusing, I'm sure, but I, I sometimes think uh, we might end up with crops we'd rather not eat either because... Um, either because that's what's offered at the nursery when you're buying starts in spring or if those are the seeds you can find or um, or possibly with something that you grew up, um, your parents growing or your grandparents growing, which that can work conversely as well. It could be that you know, your grandparents or your parents did grew, grew something you actually do love. And I think it's important to to try to figure out what those things are, discover the things you love, and focus on growing those plants. Makes sense. Right, definitely. Um, so you you use a mulching method called sheet mulching. Um, many people may not have heard of that. What is that exactly? So sheet mulching is a great way to tend to soil, especially for an in-ground plot. And it is essentially just adding organic um, layers to the topsoil or to your lawn or whatever area it is you'd like to turn into a garden. And it's often applied as a layer of cardboard and then compost. And um, there's some controversy because people, there are some people that say, well, if you add the cardboard um, and then the compost, you could create an anaerobic environment, um, which isn't great for the soil microbes, which is what helps make healthy soil and, and wonderful and nutritional food. Um, but I found that if you use a single layer of cardboard and plenty of compost, then it helps prepare that planting area and it helps make weeding much easier. So if you're trying to um, rid your garden of invasive plants or even, you know, grasses like Bermuda grass, um, it, can, it can speed that process along while also uh, tending to your soil. And, and that's what we were experimenting with last year. We put a tremendous amount of leaves on the garden. So what we've done is took cardboard and laid on the bare soil and then piled the leaves on top of it, trying to rid or smother out those invasive weeds. Uh, we have uh, several here in the Wisconsin area that uh, likes to take over the garden quite heavily. So we're trying to <laughs> mimic right. that uh, for, for us. Right, mimic nature. How did it work for you? Did it work well? Uh, I've looked at the garden right now, and it looks like it's going to work relatively well. So we'll see how this year goes uh, with the cardboard and the, the leaves on top of it. Oh, that's exciting. That's exciting. At least maybe it'll be easier to pull up those plants and, and uh, speed that process along. Absolutely, yeah. That that's the hope. We uh, you know, there's a few things you don't want to do. You don't want to do drugs, and you don't want to have too many weeds in your garden. That's kind of what I've been told. <laughs> yeah. All right. All right. So you Here's talk here. you talk about the basic ingredients of a garden. What are they? So the basic ingredients for starting a garden are sun, soil, water, and air. You have to think about um, when you're when you're first planting your garden. You have to think about um, how much sun did you receive. There. Um, you know, in your front yard or your backyard or wherever it might be that you're wanting to grow your garden. Um, the amount of sun you receive, of course, dictates what you can grow. Um, you know, if, you, if, you, if your plot only has uh, part shade, then you might have to give up your tomato dreams for leafy greens and, and parsley. Um, but you might find that leafy greens and parsley could be exactly, exactly um, what you're looking for. Um, soil, of course, tending to your soil. You want to make sure your garden is um, close to a water source. And with air, it's really important to make sure your plants um, have good air circulation to help prevent diseases. <clears throat> and of course, the, the final ingredient is, is, is love, which is something I talk about quite a bit in my book, that you know, when, 
we're growing a, when we grow a garden, we're, we're, we're growing more than a garden. We're growing a lifestyle, and that lifestyle is, is really special. Well, that's the thing, the lifestyle, that, that passing the information down from generation to generation, and, and you're eating healthier, too. You're not uh, well here, you know, most meals travel about 1,500 miles on average to get to a person's dinner table. So by having all of those in combination, you can feel better about yourself health-wise and do a little bit more better for the environment. You're exactly right. You reduce your carbon footprint, and then... And you have food right out your door. You don't need to go to the ends of the earth to find something wonderful to eat. You can, you know, plant a few seeds and 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 grow it yourself. Many people don't realize how important the soil is for your plants. I mean, if you're just an average hobby farmer, you put you just find find some soil, put a plant in it, and you think it's going to grow okay. But uh, they use fertilizer to feed the plant, but you need to feed the soil. What are some simple ways to feed your soil? Obviously, there is some importance to granular fertilizer. We uh, prefer the organic method. But what are some ways to feed your soil? Well, I tend to use quite a bit of compost. That's sort of my, my go-to um, amendment. And compost is great, especially for larger beds, either raised beds, beds um, that are, you know, minimum of like two feet. But it's great for any any container, I should say. but Smaller containers, if you add compost and manures and, and heavier materials like that, over time the soil can really become compacted and dense, and that makes it hard for your plants to grow. And so the larger your planting area, the more likely it is to mimic nature. And what you're, the goal, of course, is to feed the soil, as you're saying, because you're feeding the soil ecosystem, these microbes, these, these things you can't see and the things you can see, whether they be fungi or bacteria um, or, or actual critters that are doing the work of decomposing material and making and making it into um, something your plants can recognize. So um, compost is really my go-to. Um, and then I also use things like um, worm castings and liquid seaweed and um, uh, you know, a few things like that. I do, make, I do make manure tea, but that's really, again, as you're saying, a fertilizer to feed my plants. And, and the goal, of course, is to feed your soil. So when, you, when you're talking and growing in containers, and we stress this a lot in our talks, is you do have to continue to feed the soil in a container more than in a raised bed or ground because the leaching, as you water, as it rains, that nutrient runs out. So how do you kind of gauge on when and how much to feed the soil in those situations with a container uh, and the leaching uh, possibilities? Right, that's a, that's a, that's a good question. I, I usually just pay attention to the plants and, of course, the weather. And it, it, as you're saying, if, if it's been especially rainy um, or if for some reason the plants have been overwatered and they start to turn yellow, then you know that, uh, you know that those, those nutrients the plants need to grow is probably leached from the soil. And the smaller the container, the more likely I am in that instance to um, re repot it all together and give it a fresh batch of soil. Um, and, and then feed it occasionally, depending upon what it is. But I usually let the plants lead the way. And if, if they're looking pretty good, then I, I leave them be. And if they're, if they're starting to turn yellow and not looking so great, then I, I know that's my cue to, to give them a little bit of care. And, and for a, a hobby gardener, you might want to look at what the plant's telling you and do a little research to find out, okay, is it a disease or is it needing nutrients? So you don't jump the gun and cause more problems potentially than are already existing. That they're exactly right. You're exactly right. It all depends upon what you know what what you're actually seeing in the plant itself. And there are a few factors, but but um, and that's why I suggest to people that they grow just a handful of plants just to know those plants really well. As you say, you know, doing your research, um, you get to know those plants really well, and then it helps you troubleshoot down the line. What what was the inspiration behind your book, the book uh, Girl What You Love? Yeah, thanks for asking. Uh, this book, I I've you know through my te my work in teaching and writing, and um, I have discovered that we're wired to grow, and that when we grow the things we love, wonderful things happen. Um, and that was really that was really the, the the jump start for me. I recognized that in my own life, um, the difference. I was making a, being able to focus my attention on the plants that made the biggest difference 
And also, when I was teaching in school gardens, I, I had a couple of experiences. One particular where I um, had a parent volunteering in the garden, and the kids were busy. Kids, you know, the kids have it all figured out once given the opportunity to plant and grow. And um, parent turned to me and she, she was realizing how simple and wonderful it was. And she said, "Gosh, if I had known how how easy this was, I would have started the garden a long time ago." And it's like, oh. I, I really need to write this book so I can help people discover this simple joy. So where can people find the book? I, am, am I right? It just dropped a couple of days ago? Yeah, the book released March 1st, and it can be found wherever books are sold, um, your local bookstore or Barnes & Noble or Amazon. Um, it's out there. I, I hope everyone loves it. I it was, it was a true labor of love. A lot of work went into it, so... I hope that shows. Well, it's a phenomenal book, great pictures, not only just a coffee table book, but a educational book for that matter. There, and you know this, Emily, as much as we do. There are some people that create garden books that are simply just for fun. They, there's really not an informational. It's more of an entertaining. You have an informational book here that a lot of people can learn a lot of good information no matter where they're at in North America or the world, and we appreciate that. Thank you. So much. I really appreciate you saying so. That that makes my day. Well, Emily, thank you very much for taking time out of your day to join Holly and myself and all of our listeners and and, and sharing your information so we all can learn together. Wonderful. It was great to meet you over the radio. Absolutely. Thank you for checking out the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener radio show. For more, go to the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com for full length in studio video and podcast replay of season one, season two underway and added weekly. Tweet us at TWVG Show or hashtag TWVG to be part of the program.